Yeah, yeah, SMC. How's it going, guys? Well, my first SMC as a college kid was in 1993. 1993. Con, no SMC app. Pro, main session speaker, the Apostle Paul himself. Intense guy, I kind of liked him. My first SMC, I drove 15 hours from the great state of Colorado, where you at? Nobody at that time was coming from Colorado, Wyoming, any part of that country, so it was just me in my mom's minivan and my kid brother in the back seat. 17-year-old kid brother coming to SMC with me. He's laying down in the back seat. It's four degrees. We're driving across Kansas. The winds are blowing like 50 miles an hour, and I hear this loud bang, and all of a sudden I'm freezing cold. While my brother was sleeping, he had his feet against the back right window, and he had gone to stretch out in his dream, he said. And he pushed the window out. It shattered on the shoulder. And for the rest of the 13 hours, we froze our butts off on the way to SMC. But two things happened that week that made that freezing cold drive worth it. Number one, I took a quantum leap spiritually. I learned so much. I grew so much. Some of you are experiencing that right now. And number two, I met the woman I would later marry. I was sitting in this room just minding my own business and this door flings open and this heavenly being just floats into the room. She was working for the conference. She was seven years older than me. I was a college kid. I was not thinking. I was not thinking. Yeah, I'm going to ask her out. I was thinking, here is a woman. I am a boy. <laughs> she was actually planning the main session. I was going to share a little college kid testimony. She needed to come and talk to me because she needed to learn how to spell my name. And it's now hers. <laughs> Four years later, I would call her and ask her out. Here's my girl, Sweet Kim. Sweet Kim, Kayo in Arkansas. She's an angel, she's a sinner, but barely. This last August, this last, last August, we celebrated 25 years together. And so, and so how did we celebrate? 25 days in a row, we went out on a date. 25 lunch dates in a row. And we went taco shop, Thai food. Taco shop, Thai food. Taco shop, Thai food. 25 days in a row. She loves cinnamon, lots of churros. Gents, SMC ends tomorrow. I'm just saying, find a staff girl, get her number. I'm married to someone who never takes a bad picture. She is super photogenic, unreal smile. Uh, it makes sense, her dad was an orthodontist, so her teeth are like the work of AI or something, I don't know. They're perfect, her smile is perfect. So it didn't surprise me just this past Thanksgiving in November when we took a family photo and she looked awesome, always does. What did surprise me is when she posted it to Instagram and, made, and used a filter that made me look horrible. This is the actual family pic that she took at her Thanksgiving dinner table. This is not my granddad. This is me like a month ago. <laughs> look at this. I'm, I mean, I don't ever look good in pictures, but I look up like I'm 93 in hospice, right? How does this happen? Somehow my Instagram savvy wife forgot the purpose of filters. She, she's watching online tonight. Babe, the purpose of filters is to make you look better, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> better. We've talked this week about being anchored to Christ in a personal relationship. We've talked about being anchored in prayer. We've talked about being anchored in His Word and uh, anchored through grace filled friendships. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about anchoring yourself to a mission 
to a purpose, to a mission far greater than ourselves. Mark Twain, the two most important days of your life, the day you were born and the day you find out why. If I knew tonight was the last time I would ever speak, and if I knew I could only choose one topic to speak on, this is the topic I would choose. There's no more important topic to cover than the one we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about anchoring yourself to the right mission. There are so many purposes and so many missions calling you and enticing you in this world. I want to talk about the one that God is calling you to. Because for three years, Jesus, the God-man, night and day, spent time with three college, sorry, with 12 college-age dudes. Did you know that? The disciples were like late teens, early 20s age. They did life together. They watched him boldly speak truth. They watched him evade assassination attempts. They watched him heal the sick, comfort the hurting. They saw how he treated his mom, how he treated his siblings. They watched how he submitted to government authorities and picked on religious ones. They saw him do life. They even heard him predict his death. And a few of them would stand scared to death as they watched him be tortured and murdered. And now we're going to see him resurrected back with the disciples and he's going to give them the mission, not of a lifetime, of eternity. What will he say? Think of all the things that after he was raised from the dead, Jesus might say to his disciples, I want you guys to go into all the world and, and build shelters for the homeless. That would be a good thing. He didn't say that. I want you to go build universities in every country in the world so that the world can be educated. That would be a good thing. He didn't say that. He could have even said, go and build church buildings in every town in the world. He didn't even say that. He said something much more important. And he said something that through those 12, he says to you tonight. And he said it in Matthew 28. It says in verse 18, he came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's about to ascend. He's about to go back to the Father. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, JP said on night one that 65% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. Hmm. Is 65% of your campus following Jesus? I don't know what school you go to, but the campuses I'm on, that would not be the case. Is 65% of your Greek chapter following Jesus? Hmm. 65%. Something tells me it's just a little lower than that. Do you know how many times the word Christian is used in the Bible? The word Christian is used in the Bible only three times. And two of those times it was other people talking about followers of the way they called them in the book of Acts, followers of Jesus. It was others calling them Christians. Three times in the New Testament. How many times do you think the word disciple is mentioned? The word disciple is mentioned this many times. Something tells me I don't want to merely be a Christian. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. The word disciple in the Greek is the word mathetes. It, it's where we get our word mathematics. Um, the word means learner. It means student, adherent, follower. To be a follower of, of a guru, a teacher, and a teacher's teachings. After three years of discipling the 12, he gathers them and he says, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. Can you imagine the dude just got killed for his teachings? And then you find out, oh man, he's unbreakable. He resurrected. And then he says, I'm leaving. I don't know about you, but I would want Jesus to say, stay. I would like be wrapping my arms around his legs like, dude, please stay, please stay. We kind of need you, man. You're unbreakable. You can rise from the dead. That's going to come in handy when everybody comes to kill us. And yet Jesus goes, no, I'm going to the Father. I'm sending you out. We call this the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's a commission because he deputizes us. 
to go into the world and be his ambassadors. Could you imagine how cool it would be to be an ambassador for the United States? I don't care what country. Pick a country. Pick the most unknown country. What an honor to be an ambassador of the United States out and among the nations. And yet God says we get to be his ambassadors in the world. And so Jesus says, everything that you saw me do in the last three years, go do that. When I first got to college, uh, I found myself living with a, a man and his wife and four kids. I had bounced around schools. Uh, I ended up living with this guy and his family in a trailer park. I was sharing a room, two bunk beds with a seven-year-old kid. I remember going to bed one night, freshman year of college, going, this isn't exactly how I pictured college was going to go. And yet during that semester, Chuck discipled me. I got to watch a godly man lead his family. I got to watch him pray in the mornings. I got to watch him uh, teach his kids the Bible. I got to watch him sit in the corner chair, in the old man chair, and he would write on three-by-five card scriptures, and then he would memorize those scriptures. And I remember watching that as an 18-year-old, self-filled, egotistical, aspiring athlete, kind of punk going, I want that. I want to be like Chuck. And sometimes when the family would go to bed, I'd go walk out on Highway 75 south of Tulsa and no phones in those days. So I'd have my three by five cards and I'd hold them up. And when a car came driving down the road, I'd hold it up so I could see my scripture by the headlights. And I would try to memorize the scripture because I was trying to do what I saw him do. He was living a Christ-like life in front of me. And I didn't know it, but he was discipling me. He had been a, a professional soccer player. He was an incredible mountain climber. And while I was living with him, he got cancer in his leg and actually had to get it removed. And I'll never forget, I was wondering, how is this former professional athlete going to deal with losing a leg? Only a couple days after the surgery, we're in the grocery store. He's on his crutches and this kid comes walking around a corner and the kid stops in his tracks and he just stares at Chuck. And the mom comes, the mom's kind of embarrassed, like, don't stare, you know, he's like, looking at the kid and they lock eyes and the kid just can't quit looking, you know. Chuck gets on his crutches and goes over to the kid and looks down at him and he goes, don't run with scissors, man. <laughs> and I remember going, dude, that is the kind of perspective I want to have. That is the kind of spirit-filled gratitude and attitude that I want to have in this life. On the day I moved out from living with that family, I shook Chuck's hand and I thanked him. I said, man, thank you for letting me live with you. Thank you for giving me rides. Thank you for feeding me. Thank you for spending all this time with me. And he looked at me and he said something I'll never forget. He said, man, I didn't spend any time with you. I made an investment. And as I turned to walk away, he goes, ah. And I turned back and he goes, I expect a return. He didn't want money. That's not what he was talking about. He said, I want you to turn around and pay it forward. I established you spiritually. I poured into you. I served you. I lived a Christ-like life in front of you. I taught you how to memorize scripture. Go and make disciples at the university. How do you make disciples? It's so amazing that, that Jesus gives such a simple definition of how to make disciples. He just says two things in the Great Commission. Here's what he says. The first one, it's so easy. It only takes like 10 seconds. He goes, baptize them. Go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the, Hunt, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My youngest son, he's 17 years old. He has Asperger's syndrome, which means sometimes he gets really focused on things. Sometimes he says things that he shouldn't every now and then. He's, he's very politically incorrect, which I love. He's hilarious. <laughs> but I've ended up, you know, meeting with principals of schools and stuff like that as a result. I moved him to a new school this past year. It's a welding school. It's a tech school. It's all dudes, you know. Everybody comes in in their onesies and beards. They're like 14, you know. I'm like, who are these guys? I remember walking in. The teacher looks like one of them only times three. You know, when I go up to him, it's meet the teacher night, night one. My son's not with me. And I go, hey, man, my son's like super politically incorrect. He's kind of dirty. Like, he, he says crazy stuff. He's kind of offensive. And the guy goes, man, this is welding school. He's going to love it. I go, dude, can I hug you right now? I was so happy. I go to pick, his name's Stone. I go to pick Stone up one day from youth group last year. 
And I could see this youth pastor talking to him, and, and I just I, I cracked my windows so I could hear the conversation, but I acted like I, I wasn't listening. And uh, the, the, the guy said to Stone, he goes, hey, man, you need to get baptized. And Stone goes, yes, sir. And then the guy said some other things, and Stone just walked away and goes, yes, sir, yes, sir. You know, and, and he comes and gets in the car, and he shuts the door, and I roll up the window, window and he turns to me, and he goes, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I go, I go why, why not? He goes, why, why don't you want to get baptized? He goes, Dad, I hate public stuff. I don't want to do things in front of anybody. He goes, here's the deal, man. He goes, thing is, I believe in Jesus. I've swam underwater before. I'm baptized. <laughs> I was good with it, man, <laughs> for now, for now. Getting baptized does not get you into heaven, right? It's just a symbol. You're just showing the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ. Only faith in Christ's death gets you forgiven and into heaven. But it's still a command of Jesus that many people take lightly. You can't be unbaptized and be a disciple of Jesus. It's step one. Number two, he said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Discipleship is no more difficult than getting with somebody else who's hungry spiritually, reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then seeing what Jesus did and said, and then trying to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit and do it. That's all it is. Spending a little time in Matthew, I love what Todd said, six minutes of reading, four minutes thinking about how to apply or to obey, uh, and then go and do it. Discipleship comes down to if Jesus did it, do that. If Jesus didn't do it, don't bother with it. It's that simple. Get baptized, obey the teachings of Jesus. There is no way I'd rather live, no, no, no way I'd rather live than living a life anchored to the mission of Jesus. Think about what an anchor does. An anchor keeps a boat in a relatively small area so that it never gets very far away from exactly where you want that boat to be. I never want my life to get very far away from the mission of making disciples. Why not? I'll give you a few reasons. Number one, living a life anchored to his mission gives meaning to every moment. It gives meaning to every moment. When you're anchored to the Great Commission, you realize every moment is a chance to make disciples. One translation of the Bible says, as you go, make disciples. Make disciples Throughout your life, being anchored to the mission of making disciples gives meaning to hanging out with your younger brother, watching a game with your friends from high school, or maybe even an Uber ride. A couple of days ago when I landed at Love Field, I caught an Uber and I, I jumped in this guy. The guy picked me up in a minivan. I was comfortable with that. I got in. I said, uh, hey, man, this, this, this minivan's sweet. My mom used to have one just like it. He wasn't really liking that compliment. I go, what's your name? And he goes, Ace. I go, dude, I love that name. So we got to talking for a while. And after a while, I go, are you married, Ace? He goes, yeah, I've been married three years. Any kids? He goes, yeah, I have a daughter, eight months old. I go, man, I bet she's beautiful. And he goes, actually, <laughs> I'm like, where is this going? <laughs> he goes, actually, she looks like Steve Harvey. And he pulls down his phone to, to prove it. He pulls his phone off the rearview mirror. He starts swiping pics, and he shows me this pic right here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he showed me a pic of his eight-month-old old daughter. No lie, she did have hair on her upper lip. She looked like Steve Harvey. I go, dude, you're not lying. He goes, I know, man. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. He turns the corner. We're like 10 minutes from here. And he goes, Jesus Christ, there's lots of traffic here. Now, for me, I can't hear somebody take my Savior's name in vain without my heart physically hurting, and it did. And he did it twice. And I wasn't judging him for it, but it hurt my heart to hear it. So after the second time, I said, Ace, you keep saying the name of Jesus Christ. Are you religious? He goes, I don't mean anything by that. No, I'm not, I'm not super religious. I go... I go, you might not mean anything by it. And I think I had a rapport with him by, by now, but I said, you might not mean anything by it, but man, I worship Jesus. He went to the cross for me. In fact, like this morning, I was on my knees worshiping him. He's my creator and God. You shouldn't do that. And then I said, man, do you know what the word gospel means? And I, I do this a lot in conversations, and I fully expected him to say no, but he said, yeah, doesn't that mean good news? It does. 
And we begin to engage in an incredible, for the next 10 minutes, gospel conversation. And Ace showed me that even though he was using the Lord's name in vain, he had some hunger about him. When I dropped him off, I got his number. I always do this. Some guys think it's weird. I don't care. And I shot him a text. This is the text I shot him, actually. I just said, Ace, man, if I can ever help you, let me know. Peace. <laughs> and he goes, absolute pleasure meeting you. Thank you for the enlightening conversation, Brother Sean. I got two sons. That you guys... <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> this, is a, this is a habit of mine. Like, if I meet you and I put you in my phone, like, you're going to get a long description. <laughs> I forgot that was on there. My kids crack up, man. Like, I'll be like, hey, Siri, call Joe, and it'll, it'll be like 50 words later, you know, and I'll call him. For such a long time... For such a long time, I lived like so many people do. I lived for me. I lived for my ego, my identity, to satisfy my own lusts, to satisfy my fleshly desires. And you know what it turned me into? It turned me into a ball of meat that's just walking around seeking pleasure for myself. I was consumed by self. You know what that isn't? Meaningful. It's not a meaningful life. But it's the existence for many. Making disciples, being anchored to that mission of making disciples in the world is a meaningful, other-centered life. You were made for more. You were made for a mission. And when you're on mission, every moment has meaning. Why are so many people unhappy in the world? Why, when we have so much wealth and so much technology and so much opportunity, are people unhappy at unprecedented Numbers. It's because I think they think they are their desires. You are not your desires. You, you are not your desires. They don't define you. They don't give your life meaning. What gives your life meaning? What you do for others. Knowing Christ. Growing in Christ. I know a fraternity guy uh, back in Arizona, and every time I see him, he's just always in a big hurry. You know, it's hard to even talk to him. You've got to walk fast as you're walking along with Joe. Joe, how, how's it going? You? And he always says the same thing. He's going, dude, I'm out here trying to change the world, man, living the dream, trying to change the world. He just says that over and over and over. And I've tried to ask him like 10 times, like, what do you mean change the world? How are you going to change the world? What are you going to do to change the world? The best I've ever got out of him is he's going to start a coffee shop. You know, like, okay. <laughs> Changing the world. Is not going to come through marching in a protest or political activism or liking the right posts. Here's how you change the world. You change the world by changing someone's world. And the way you do that is you help them become a disciple of Jesus. You are made for a mission. That mission gives meaning to every moment. Not only does living a life anchored to his mission give meaning to every moment, living a life anchored to his mission liberates you from yourself. It liberates you from yourself. Man, I feel for kids. Think about how hard it was on you growing up with, with social media and phones and all the insecurity and all the anxiety that comes with that. And then put COVID on top of that. Think about the kids five years behind you. Think about the kids ten years behind you. I feel for all of them. Facing four major giants, anxiety slash depression, rampant. Um, Identity confusion, swirling messages all around them. The world is telling them they are their desires. Uh, th there's a war on truth. If you take a moral stance and say, I think that's wrong and I think that's right, and, and it's because Scripture says, then you're labeled what? Bigoted. And finally, we live in this hyper-sexualized culture. It's everywhere. And most recently, the culture wants to sexualize children and normalize being minor-attracted is what they're calling it now, as if it's natural and doesn't come directly from having your mind perverted from porn. And it's inside this completely hijacked culture that I want to share with you some of the best news that I could ever share with you. And it's this. The way to find life in this world is actually simple. I didn't say it's easy, but it's simple. It's to give your life away. The way to find life in this world is to give yours away. 
One time Jesus was explaining discipleship, followership, adhering to him. And here's what he said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Three really hard things. He said he must deny himself, like stop chasing your flesh, stop going after what you want. That's hard. He said, take up his cross daily, an instrument of execution. Paul said, I crucify my flesh to the world and follow me. And and in those days, to follow Jesus was physically demanding. It was leaving your house. It was leaving your pillow and your bed and everything that you were comfortable with. And actually, literally, physically following Jesus on a three-year road trip, sleeping with your head on rocks. The Bible said foxes have holes, birds have nests. The the son of man, Jesus, had no place to lay his head. It was an uncomfortable trip. It doesn't really sound very fun. But Jesus said that's the cost. But here's the part that's good to know. Here's the verse 24. Because after Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you got to do these three hard things. He then said this. He said, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. Whoever holds on to their life, their dreams, their comforts, their tiny little world, tightly, it'll rot in their hands. And yet if you give your life away freely, if you pursue this mission of helping others become disciples of Jesus, you will find life. Making disciples liberates you from yourself. I'm all about life hacks. I love little shortcuts. If I can spend $5 to to save 30 minutes, I'll do it. I I pay Stone uh, to pick up our mail and take all the mail out of the uh, envelopes and throw them away. I I, I love just little life hacks like that. I work out in my street clothes. All my friends who know me, they they know, like, I give really long uh, descriptions of people in my iPhone, and I work out in, like, my street clothes. I was in the gym today in these clothes because I realized if I go change clothes and then I I go work out, it's never going to happen. Like, I'll start changing clothes and then... I'll eat a Reese's peanut butter cup while I'm sitting there, and it's just, I'm never going to get there, right? I love life hacks. I want to share, you guys are going, that's not a life hack, that's just weird. (laughs) I want to share with you a life hack for happiness that works every single time. If you're unhappy, do this, you'll be happy. Life hack for happiness, make disciples. Make disciples. Anchor yourself to the mission of making disciples. It will liberate you from yourself. Very quickly, you'll find yourself forgetting about all the pain in your life, all your hassles, all the complaints that you have because you start becoming concerned with somebody else's salvation, somebody else's growth, somebody else's spiritual life. Several years ago, I was hanging out at this party, and I got to talking to this Chinese guy, this college kid. He was, he was a junior and we're talking, I got to asking him, hey, where do you live? Oh, I live across town with this Filipino guy. He's an incredible chef. Like, he, he cooks for me every day. I'm like, dude, that sounds like such a great thing. Like, maybe I should move in with you guys. And he's like, ah, you wouldn't like it. And, and just making conversation, I go, well, maybe you should move in with us, you know, sometime. Yeah, okay. And then I just walked away. The next day, I get a text from this guy. His name's Sam Pan. I get a text that says, hey, man, is this afternoon good? And I text him back, um, Good, good for what? And he goes, to move in. <laughs> I called my wife. I go, hey, uh, what would you think about having a Chinese guy move in today? <laughs> I told you she's, she's a sinner, but barely. <laughs> she goes, that's great. So I call him back. I go, like, 3 o'clock, Sam Pan moves into our house. <laughs> because I gave one flippant statement, come live with us. It's okay, though. He was only there two years. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it was an incredible two years. There were so many cultural misses. There was so much <laughs> confusion in our house. First of all, he cooked eggs every morning at 1.30. <laughs> our bedroom was pretty close to the kitchen, so that woke us up all the time. Another thing he did is he would come back late from working out about 2 a.m. and he would take a shower and the shower was close to our son's, our two son's rooms, uh, room. And so one morning, uh, one of our sons comes up and he goes, hey, Sam Pan's taking a shower at like 2 a.m. Like it's waking us up every time. So I sit Sam Pan down. I'm like, hey, dude, you can't like do the shower thing at 2 a.m. down there. It's like waking up those guys. Okay, my bad, my bad. So the next morning at 2 a.m., 
I wake up, I hear water running. It's my shower. <laughs> I go in there, <laughs> he's taking a shower. Hey, dude, uh, how's it going? You know, I don't know if I know anything. I go, oh, yeah, it's going good, man. I just didn't even say anything. I just let it go. <laughs> just roll with it, man, at that point. One day I heard him yelling in Chinese. He was on Skype, okay, Zoom, if you're, you know. Anyway, he, he's, he's yelling at, at this Chinese lady, just like yelling at her, and she's like pointing at him, yelling back, and they're yelling back and forth. And I'm like, geez, I'm like praying for peace, you know, conflict resolution. He gets off the call, and I go, dude, is everything okay? Who's that rando lady you're yelling at? And he goes, oh, dude, that was my mom. I was just telling her how much I love her and how much I enjoy America. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like you guys are like pointing at each other and stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, well, this, we're good. That was a great conversation, you know. <laughs> In some ways, it was really inconvenient to have Sam Pan live with us for 24 months. There were times I just wanted to chill and watch the game, and he wanted to ask me, like, the history of McDonald's or something, you know. <laughs> and we gave up some privacy and some convenience, but you know what? It helped liberate us from ourselves. And we built this rich discipleship relationship. He brought his mom to Christ. And then he brought his parents over <laughs> to to, to the states, and, and we got to talk with them, both his, his mom and his dad, about the gospel. Uh, he was doing it in Chinese, obviously, but, you know, he was translating. It was incredible. Did you know God's heart is for every single person to have a relationship with him? There's not a person you'll ever walk by. There's not a person in the grocery store that you'll ever have an interaction with. There's not a person that you'll ever interact with on the phone, even one of these uh, telemarketing calls or, 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 or any student that you take a class with. God wants to have a relationship with every single person. Not just Americans, not just Southerners, not just people in so-called Christian countries, not just people in certain political parties. God wants to have a relationship with every single person. When our kids were younger, we wanted to pray for different countries, and so we'd spin a globe, and then we'd put our finger on it, and whatever country it stopped on, we would pray for that country, and more often than not, it seemed like it ended up on China. There are more teenagers in China than there are people in America tonight. Think about that. If you live in Hong Kong, you're a five-hour flight from 70% of the world's youth. Draw a circle. Nicest city I've ever been to, by the way, Hong Kong. It's incredible. It's like 100 bucks for a grilled chicken, but it's nice. <laughs> you got to go ve vegan, but you could go there and reach people, man. 500 million Chinese teenagers, and someone is going to disciple them. I don't know who, but someone needs to disciple 500 million Chinese teenagers. And you know what's going to happen to that someone, whoever it is? I don't know who it is. Who, whoever that person is, here's what's going to happen to them. They will be liberated from self. And we'll thank them for their sacrifice and they'll go, I never sacrificed. I was liberated from self. Not only does living a life anchored to his mission give meaning to every moment and liberate you from yourself, but making disciples, guys, is fun. Living the Great Commission is fun. We got to baptize a guy named Andrew Hubler just, just this last fall. Some of you guys know him. Uh, this was down in Arizona. He's from Chicago, and he had come to Christ in college, but he hadn't been baptized yet. And so he called us up, and he goes, hey, let's go up in, in the mountains up near Sedona. There's, there's this uh, swimming hole where people jump off cliffs, and I, I want to get baptized. And so we went walking up this path, and it was so cool because as we were walking up this path, one of the guys goes, guys, I've been reading Psalm 89. And he just pulls out his little his little uh, sword, you know, his little pocket Bible, and he just starts reading to us from Psalm 89. And I just got to the back, and I just started snapping pictures because I was like, dude, this is the Great Commission being lived out. And we got up on this little skinny path, and guys started talking about how the path following Jesus is a narrow path, and the, and the fellowship that was happening that day was absolutely incredible. And, and then we baptized Andrew. It was an unbelievable experience. And then after that, we just started goofing around. There were a bunch of fraternity guys there, too, from from uh, Arizona State University, and there was this little, um, like, two cliffs, and th there were a couple of, like, very small branches leading across from between these two cliffs, and the guys were trying to, like, walk across these little branches to, to get to the other side to, to do some cliff jumping, and I remember thinking, I was shooting some different videos, and I remember thinking, like, 
I don't think those branches are going to hold like these guys. And sure enough, I go to film this guy cliff jumping, and in the background, I'll show it to you guys. But yeah, here's, here are the little branches that these guys are trying to go across. There's like a pretty big drop there. And I think I took a video. I can't remember if I, we put it in, in here even, but yeah, yeah. So this guy jumps in, and then you can see in the background, actually, the branches did break. And so he's hanging there. <laughs> and the whole time, he's getting road rashes. He's pulling them up. And he gets to the top, and dude's, like, safe. And Andrew was, like, actually in a lot of pain. And after I filmed that video, you know what my thought was? Discipleship is fun. Like, this is cool, man. Like, we are doing the Great Commission out here. It was so cool. Do not let people tell you following Christ is social suicide. Those same people in the frat that are telling you following Christ is social suicide, you know what they're, they're going to end up 10 years from now? Bored in the burbs. Drinking their bourbon every night going, what am I doing? Where's my life going? Don't let yourself be ostracized. Making disciples is fun. Let me give you one last reason that I'm trying to stay anchored to the mission, and it's this. When you make disciples, you get to see God change lives. You get to see God change lives. Several years ago, my wife and I, we lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I went down, I went down to the Hyper, man. The Hyper is like built in 19, 1978 or something. They're super proud of it. The weight room is like the size of a third of the stage. It's kind of embarrassing. I love University of Arkansas, but the Hyper building, it could use some work. So I go into the gym. I used to go in there and play basketball all the time. And I get in this game, and we're running back and forth. And I'm a pretty average hooper. But I was like, eh, it never stopped me from taking a lot of shots. So I'm that guy. So I took a lot of shots in this game, kind of shot us out of the game, and I go back to the bench, and we lost, you know, and I, I look down at the end of the bench, and here's this guy, he doesn't like me. I could tell, I could tell he didn't like how many shots I took, and I'm kind of looking down at him, and uh, I go, yo, what's up? And he goes, dude, you took a lot of shots. I go, yeah? He goes, you didn't hit any of them. <laughs> I go, dude, shooters got to shoot. <laughs> so I go, hey you know what, let's go in the gym next door and I'll play you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm 38 years old at this time, and I look like I'm 38-year-old dad. And Rod Harris looks at me and he goes, for what? And I go, if I beat you, we're going to Slim Chickens, and you're paying. And we're going to hang out and talk about God. And he goes, oh. I go, if you beat me, I'm buying Slim Chickens, all good. I win the first game. I'm like, this is going to go well. He wins the next three out of five. <laughs> we go to Slim Chickens the next day. We sit down and we open the Bible. I go, Rod, tell me about your life. He grew up in North Little Rock. He had a hard life. He had a tough go. But he had some cool people in his life that started to build into him. And Rod, I go, what are you into, Rod? He goes, I'm into shoes. Rod had a collection of Nike Air Jordans. He had about 50 pair worth about 20 grand. This is probably 10 years ago. It'd be a well, worth a lot more now. I began to build a relationship with Rod, and Rod began to build a relationship with me that changed both our lives. I said, Rod, would you want to go to Kaleo? He goes, what is that? I show him a picture. He goes, man, I see two black folk in that picture. I go, let's make it three. Rod goes, I'm in. <laughs> Rod comes down to Kaleo, and God radically changes his life. He became in some ways a part of my family. He went on a trip to Colorado with us, and he, he met my parents and stayed with my parents. His mom called him. She goes, are you staying with the white folks up there? <laughs> it was awesome. It was so funny. I, he, he got me on the phone. He's a cool guy. Like, you know, it worked out. Rod took off growing. We built a relationship over the next couple of years. He took off growing spiritually. I remember one time we had a, we had a hedgehog in our, uh, under our house. And I called him up. I was like, what do I do with this hedgehog? And he goes, man, I got a 22. I'll be over there. <laughs> so Rod walks across town with his loaded 22 like this. <laughs> College guy. 
He gets to my house. I go, dude, what are you doing? Like, there's campus cops. There's all kind of stuff. He goes, it's Arkansas, dog. We're good. <laughs> we go under. We can't find the hedgehog. Rod had this social anxiety. He would get super nervous. His, actually, his forehead would begin to sweat. More than two, three people in the room, his forehead would just start sweating. I'd start making fun of him. I'd just clown him over. I'd be like, hey, dude, you're sweating. You know? like, I know, I know. You know, just do like that. Rod calls me up about a year ago. He, he was living in Memphis. He had gone through downlines. Some of you guys have heard that. It's a discipleship ministry. It's a great ministry. And he said, man, I am growing spiritually and preaching to people. I go, do what? He goes, man, they ask me each week to stand up, and I am teaching the Bible to people. I go, Mr. Sweatyhead is teaching the Bible to people. He goes, yeah. I go, man, do you know what 3 John 4 says? He goes, no. I said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And you are giving me that joy right now, my brother. He calls me up a few months later. He goes, oh, I forgot to tell you I'm dating a girl. And she's godly, man. You would like her. I go, Mr. Sweaty is dating a girl. How did you ask her out? <laughs> they got married. I said, do you know what 1 Thessalonians 3 says? He goes, yeah, I do. I go, quote it to me. He said, verse 8, for now we really live, for you are standing firm in the Lord. I go, dude, you are giving me life. When you call me and you tell me about what God is doing in your life, you are giving me life. I teared up on that phone call. Rod was a different person. He had become a Jesus-following, God-loving, godly man and a disciple-maker on mission. I'll show you just a couple pics because I, I, I love this guy so much. But th this is Rod right here, I think, with his shoes. <laughs> I love that pic. I forgot to tell you, one of the things that pushed Rod toward Christ in the end, Rob loved those, Rod loved those shoes maybe too much. Someone broke into his apartment and stole every pair when he was a college kid. This is his stack of shoes. He came in one day and they were totally gone. And I called him to comfort him and he goes, don't comfort me, man. My hope today transferred over to Christ. It was in those shoes. It went to Christ. I think I got a couple more. I got too many picks, but that's Rod in the middle. This is downline, class of 2021. And this is the last picture he sent me, last two pictures. He went to Nepal on a mission trip. Dude is over there training pastors. Unbelievable, man. One last pick I think we got when he called and said, here's my son. This is Rama. I don't think Rama likes that outfit too much. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 24 that we are reaching a time in this world when the love of most will grow cold. Do you feel that a little bit? Mr. Beast did a survey just the other day on Twitter, and he said, <laughs> what's this dude quoting Mr. Beast for? <laughs> he did a survey on Twitter, and he said, if you could get $10,000, but some rando on earth has to die simultaneously, do you take the ten grand? A half a million people responded, and 47% said, give me the money. Jesus said, a time is coming when the love of most will grow cold. I think we're in that time. Don't just be a Christian. Be a disciple. And be a disciple on mission. Every one of you, if you're just one step following Christ, you're far enough to help somebody else go one step. Every one of us can disciple one more person because here's the thing. When you go out and you live on mission and you disciple people, disciples multiply. Did you know if you take a piece of paper and you fold it, it becomes twice as thick? You're like, yeah. And then if you fold it again, it becomes twice as thick as that? And do you know that if you did that 42 times, do you know how thick that paper would be? It would be wide enough slash long enough to reach the moon. If you fold it 42 times, it would reach the moon. It's called the power of multiplication. If each one will reach one and disciple one, 
That is how we reach the world. If you want to change a fraternity, make disciples. If you want to change a family, make disciples. If you want to change your campus, make disciples. If you want to change your community, make disciples. If you want to change the world, change someone's world by helping them become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you allow us to join with you in this incredible mission that we can anchor ourselves to the great co-mission that you do with us. God, please give us grace in our pursuit of you to live this life on mission. We love you and we do it for you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.